Chapter Twelve of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Attack on the Mine. There was a moment when I had an opportunity to speak with Jetta. Gutierrez sat watchfully by the archway corridor entrance with a needle projector across his knees. The fellow Hans, a big, heavy set half breed Dutchman, with a wide-collared leather jerkin and wide knee-length pantaloons, laid his weapon carefully aside and busied himself with his image mirror. There would soon be images upon it, I knew. De Beer had the lens finder on his forehead, and the scenes at the mine, as De Beer saw them, would be flashed back to us here. This Gutierrez was very watchful, a move on my part, and I knew he would fling a needle through me. My thoughts flew. Hanley had notified Puerto Rico. The patrol ship had almost enough time to get here by now. I felt Jetta plucking at me. She whispered, They have gone to attack the mine. Yes. I heard it planned. Senor Perona. Her hurried whispers told me further details of Perona's scheme. So this was a pseudo-attack. Perona would take advantage of it and hide the quicksilver. De Beer would return presently and escape, and hold me for ransom. I chuckled grimly. Not so easy for a bandit, even one as clever as De Beer, at hiding in the lowland depths to arrange a ransom for an agent of the United States. Our entire lowland patrol would be after him in a day. Jetta's swift whispers made it all clear to me. It was Perona's scheme. She ended, and my father. Her voice broke, her eyes flooded suddenly with tears. Oh, Philip, he was good to me, my poor father. I saw that the mirror before Hans was glowing with its coming image. I pressed Jetta's hand. Yes, Jetta. One does not disparage the dead. I could not exactly subscribe to Jetta's appraisal of her parent, but I did not say so. Jetta, the mirror is on. I turned away from her toward the instrument table. Gutierrez at the door raised his weapon. I said hastily, Nothing, I. We just want to see the mirror. I stood beside Hans. He glanced at me, and I tried to smile ingratiatingly. This attack will be successful, ah, uh, Hans? Damn, I hope so. The mirror was glowing. Hans turned a switch to dim the tube lights of the room so that we might see the images better. It brought a protest from Gutierrez. I swung around. I'm not a fool. You can see me perfectly well. Kill me if I make trouble. I want to see the attack. Por Dios, if you try anything... I won't. Shut, growled Hans. The audiophone is on. The big adventure and the commander leaves me here just to watch. A slit in the observatory pane was open. The dark figure of one of the bandits on guard outside came and called softly up to us. Started, Hans? Starting. Should it go wrong, call out. Yes, but it will not. There was an alarm, relayed probably, to Great New York, the commander said from Spawn's garden. These cursed prisoners. Shut. Keep your watch out there. It is starting. The guard slunk away. My attention went back to the mirror. An image was formed there now, coming from the eye of the lens upon De Beer's forehead. It swayed with his walking. He was evidently leading his men for none of them were in the scene. The dark rocks were moving past. The lights of the mine were ahead and below, but coming nearer. The audiophone hummed and crackled, and through it the beer's low-voiced command sounded. To the left is the better path. Keep working to the left. The image of the rocks in the mine swung with a dizzying sweep as the beer turned about. Then again, he was creeping forward. The mine lights came closer. De Beer's whispered voice said, 
There they are. I could see the lights of the mine's guard flash on. A group of Spawn's men gathered before the smelter building. The challenge sounded. Who are you? Stop. And De Beers murmur. That is correct, as Perona said. They expect us. Well, he ended with a sardonic laugh. Expect us. His projector went up. He fired. In the silence of the control room, we could hear the audiophoned hiss of it and see the flash in the mirror scene. He had fired into the air. Again his low voice to his men. Hold steady. They will run. The group of figures at the smelter separated, waved, and scattered back into the deeper shadows. Their hand lights were extinguished, but the moonlight caught and showed them. They were running away, hiding in the crags. They fired a shot or two high in the air. De Beer was advancing swiftly now. The image swayed and shifted, raised and lowered rhythmically as he ran. And the dark shape of the smelter building loomed large as he neared it. I felt Jetta beside me, heard her whisper. Why, he should attack and then come back. Greco told my father. But the beer was not coming back. He was dashing for the smelter entrance. Spawn's guards must have known then that there was something wrong. Their shots hissed, still fired high, and our grid sounded their startled shouts. Then as the beer momentarily turned his head, I saw what was taking place to the side of him. A detachment of the bandits had followed the retreating guards. The bandits' shots were leveled now, dim stabs of light in the gloom. One of the guards screamed as he was struck. The attack was real, but it was over in a moment. Spawn's men, those who were not struck down, plunged away and vanished. Perona had disconnected the mine's electrical safeguards. The smelter door was sealed, but it gave before the blows of a metal bar two of De Beer's men were carrying. In the unguarded, open strong room, Perona alone was absorbed in his task of carrying the ingots of Quicksilver down into the hidden compartment beneath its metal floor. Our mirror was vague and dim now, with a moving interior of the main smelter room as the beer plunged through. At the strong room entrance he paused, with his men crowding behind him. The figure of Perona showed in the vague light. He was stooping under the weight of one of the little ingots. Beside him yawned the small trap opening leading downward. He saw De Beer. He straightened, startled, and then shouted with a terrified Spanish oath. De Beer's projector was leveled, the huge foreshortened muzzle of it blotted out half our image. It hissed its puff of light, a blinding flash on our mirror, in the midst of which the dark shape of Perona's body showed as it crumpled and fell. Like Spawn, he met instant death. Jetta was gripping me. Why? Gutierrez was with us. Hans was bending forward, watching the mirror. He muttered, Got him. I saw a chance to escape and pulled at Jetta, but at once Gutierrez stepped backward. Like him, I will strike you dead, he said. No chance of escape. I had thought Gutierrez absorbed by the mirror, but he was not. I protested vehemently. I haven't moved, you fool. I have no intention of moving. And now De Beer and his men were carrying up the ingots, a man for each bar, a confusion of blurred swaying shapes and low-voiced, triumphant murmurs from our disk. Then De Beer was outside the smelter house, and we saw a little queue of the bandits carrying the treasure up the defile, coming back here to the flyer. There was no pursuit. The mine guards were gone. The triumphant bandits would be here in a few moments. Ave Maria! K. Magnifico! Gutierrez had retreated to our doorway, more alert than ever, upon me and Jetta. Hans called through the window slit. All is well, Franks? 
Got it. Yes, make ready. There was a stir outside as several of the bandits hastened down the defile to meet De Beer, and the tread of others inside the flyer at their posts, preparing for hasty departure. Han snapped off the audio phone and mirror. He bent over his control panel. All is well, Gutierrez. In a moment we start. Through the observatory window I saw the line of De Beer's men coming. Abruptly, Hans gave a cry. Look! A glow was in the room, a faint aura of light, and our disconnected instruments were crackling, murmuring with interference. Eavesdropping waves were here. Hans realized it. So did I. But there was no need for theory. From outside came shouts. Patrol ship. Hurry. The ship, suddenly exposing its lights, was perfectly visible above us. Five thousand feet up, possibly. A tiny silver bird in the moonlight. But even with the naked eye, I could see by its light pattern that it was the official Puerto Rican patrol liner. It saw us down here, recognized this bandit flyer, no doubt. And it was coming down. There was a confusion as the bandits rushed aboard. The patrol was dropping in a swift spiral. I watched tensely, holding Jetta with the turmoil of the embarking bandits around us. Gutierrez stood with leveled weapon. They have not moved, Commander. The beer was here. The treasure was aboard. Ready, Hans, lift us. The landing ports clanged as they closed. Hans shoved at his switches. I heard the helicopter engine thumping, a vertical lift. There was no space in this rocky defile for any horizontal takeaway. He was very calm, this De Beer. He sat in a chair at a control bank, of instruments unfamiliar to me. Full power, Hans. I tell you, lift us. The ship was quivering. We lifted. The rocks of the gully dropped away but the patrol ship was directly over us. Was the beer rushing into a collision? Now, forward, Hans. We poised for level flight. Did the beer think he could outdistance this patrol ship, the swiftest type of flyer in the service? I knew that was impossible. The silver ship overhead was circling, watchful, and as we leveled for forward flight, it shot a warning searchlight beam down across our bow, ordering us to land. De Beer laughed. They think they have us. I saw his hand go to a switch. A warning siren resounded throughout our corridor, warning the bandits of De Beer's next move. But I did not know it then. The thing caught me unprepared. De Beer flung another switch. My senses reeled. I heard Jetta cry out. My arm about her tightened. A moment of strange, whirling unreality. The control room seemed fading about me. The tube lights dimmed. A green glow took their place. A lurid sheen in which the cubby and the tense faces of De Beer and Hans showed with ghastly pallor. Everything was unreal. The voices of De Beer and Hans sounded with a strange tonelessness stripped of the timber that made one different from the other, hollow ghosts of human voices. By the sound, I could not tell which was De Beer and which was Hans. The corridor was dark. All the lights on the ship faded into this horrible dead green. The window beside me had a film on it, a dead dark opening where moonlight had been. Then I realized that I was beginning to see through it once more. Starlight, then the moonlight. We had soared almost level with the descending patrol ship. We went past it, a quarter of a mile away. Went past, and it did not follow. It was still circling. I knew then what had happened, and why this bandit ship had seemed of so strange an aspect. We were invisible. At four hundred yards, even in the moonlight, the patrol could not distinguish us. 
only ten of these ex-flyers were in existence. They were the closest secret of the U.S. Anti-War Department. No other government had them except in impractical imitations. I had never even seen one before. But this bandit ship was one, and I recalled that a year ago a suppressed dispatch intimated that the service had lost one. Wrecked in the lowlands and never found. So this was that lost invisible flyer. De Beer, using it for smuggling, with Perona and Spawn as partners. And now De Beer, making a way in it with Spawn's treasure. The bandit's hollow, toneless, unreal chuckle sounded in the gruesome, lurid green light of the control room. I think that surprised them. The tiny silver shape of the baffled local patrol ship faded behind us as we flew northward over heavy, fantastic crags, far above the twinkling lights of the village of Narita, out over the sullen dark surface of the Nares Sea. End of chapter 12